So my role quite mm -hmm. quickly became that of thinking of how will the user see this? How will the user understand it? How do we explain it to the user? How do I create user benefits from all these fantastic innovation? And, and I think that's somehow a bit of a red thread in all the jobs I've done where I've kind of connected and I, I love being in companies and in a world where there is a ton of new cool tech and my my link is somehow always how do I tell the story mm -hmm. about that how do I see the usage of that and that's I think how you create relevance with customers and partners now you got I a think, kind of longish answer maybe <laughs> no but this is touching so many different areas like you talked about tech and how like if i see my life for example uh, i got an expo my first computer was a 16k tandy it was i bought it in us i was at that time in us and i bought a 16k tandy and then moved to uh, pcs with their floppy disk and then you were talking about cd roms and then <laughs> that is obsolete now like imagine in a single lifetime that's the level of change that we have yeah. gone through exactly and, and what i what i really like when we when you talked about that it, you were driven by a force of culture, learning new languages, exploring new things. I think that's something which is so much crucial uh, for today's generation with all this information overload happening, yeah. that how do you make space for yourself and your own personal thing? Yeah. So great to know that. And last point that you made about, and that's for our entrepreneurship community here, being focused on the users as early stage entrepreneurs at times we are just focused on the product so focusing on the user is the key uh, but tell me how has the experience been in the tech and telecom sector for you what what do you think is it playing a central role peripheral role or a driving role in how the world is moving forward mm. what do you see and how is it evolving so I think it's um, you made some really interesting points. So let me come back to some of the points you just made, especially on the user and the startup community. But I think the uh, on that topic, I think it came from. I, th I think if we think about from the journey, my journey started somewhere ninety three, ninety four. It it came from being quite a disruptor, and I think going to only bring people on board who were really the the fast movers or the early early uh, pioneers and all of that to. What we see today on, on technology is that the world is not going to be able to even survive unless mm -hmm. we have technology, startups and innovation to solve our bigger problems. And, and to me, it became so even more apparent and clear during COVID-19. Uh, because what I, I sometimes I say to, to my colleagues here and my friends that imagine if COVID-19 had hit before we had digitalized. And imagine if it had hit before science had come this far. Imagine if we had not been able to work from home and keep hospitals going, schools going, uh, companies going. And imagine if we did not get that vaccine as quickly as we as we did get it, even if we haven't rolled it out quickly enough to the world. But these are these are these are now. It's it's about how we keep the world and, and life together. That's how fundamental technology had become. That was not the case. 20 years ago right but today that's the case mm -hmm. we would not have been when schools um and now i'm using swedish examples so i know it's different all around the world but in 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 sweden the uh, high schools they had a week to go from physical education to to uh virtual education online education and it may sound like well Swedes are pretty tech savvy some of you will think but teachers had never ever done education online over a Teams platform or some other video platform, collaboration platform. So doing that transition in a week's time and putting hundreds of thousands of kids into online education, training tens of thousands of teachers to do this, uh, what would we have done if, if we hadn't been able to do that? So uh, so so tech is pervasive. It's It will solve, and, and many of you are probably into impact uh, and social entrepreneurship. It will solve climate problems. It will solve traffic problems. It will create inclusive education. It will create more equal health care. Um, it's not just about doing the exciting thing or bringing us more music apps or something. It's so pervasive into to today's world. And without it, I don't know how we can create a better world for ourselves. Very interesting points. Uh, <laughs> I can relate to, again, so what you are talking, I can make such a strong personal connection there. You talked about the Swedish schools, how in a week's time, everything uh, or almost everything went virtual. 
Uh, and I remember, because I coach a lot of startups at Companion, and we had these, for the first week only, these awkward meetings on Teams and uh, <laughs> other platforms uh, uh, where it was the first time that entrepreneurs were connecting on a digital platform mm. and it was difficult. Uh, but in a period of two to three weeks, all that changed, the entire dynamics of meetings, how people interacted. And it now mm-hmm. seems we have been doing it forever. Yeah. Like uh, the, the digital talks and the digital. It's uh, fascinating, uh, uh, right? It's, and, I, and I, it's fascinating. And, and there's an aspect and for us as well, even if we're a tech company, I would say we had that kind of shift. And I think even when you see, I love seeing all your, your comments in the chat where you where you're joining from. I mean, the inclusiveness when you do things online, right? You can include your colleagues in India or in Pennsylvania or in Tebby or and you're all there in equal ways it's not like the ones who happen to live where the headquarter is can be in the room and then we have two poor people who are in in a different part of the world that cannot join so they are in a different surrounding so i think there is there's an inclusiveness by that we i think we have we all need to learn from during this covid 19 by actually learning how to master these online collaboration tools even though we love to see each other of course i miss seeing people so but but still i think there's a big learning in exactly what you just said exactly um, and i think we had a couple of speakers here like we had large yonro here from equity uh, ventures he uh, equity ventures is one of the leading vcs so he was here a few yeah. weeks, uh, months ago and then we had uh, patrick from kiosk and both of them said that this has huge implications for startups in terms of getting global mentorships, global investment. So now startups can actually, today you can be running something here and pitching to an investor based in London or Silicon Valley. Yes. It's no longer that you need to show up. That yes. show, the, the show up by necessity culture is gone, I think. Yes. So it's become a choice. And I think that's very important because human beings are creature of choices. We want to make choices. Exactly. So previously, maybe we were forced into interactions, which could have been done a different yeah. way. So, yes, um, uh, I, I heard that from another an, uh, an investor and banker friend of mine who said, "I would never have imagined I would make investments into companies or done M and A uh, over video exactly. without seeing the sites and the headquarters or the factories or whatever." And now I'm doing it all the time. So the, I think this is a really important point for for startups actually to to think in that way. Great. Um, let's go a little bit into Microsoft. How, if you could tell our audience, like, how do you work in Sweden, um, mm-hmm. especially, and then we can probably discuss a little bit about your work in startup. But first, like, how does Microsoft yeah. operate in Sweden? How do you work globally? A little bit yeah. on that, if you could. Absolutely. So let me start and then please uh, just add questions or clarification points or something. So I just want to set some context because many of you, of course, know of or know Microsoft from mm-hmm. from uh, from many years, probably. And and 2014, Microsoft uh, had a new president uh, taking over from from Steve Ballmer. His name is Satya Nadella and he's still our CEO. And uh, he started a new uh, journey, uh, really a complete new journey with Microsoft and and prior to that I would say I simplify it but but we were a software licenses license company we sold primarily we sold productivity software to our customers very important mm-hmm. uh, productivity software but still it was a licensed business and with the new direction and and the new journey that was started um, we ventured into a somewhat new territory. So firstly, we became a cloud company and we became a platform company. Uh, and that's quite different because what we say in, uh, what we say in uh, Satya Nadella has a, a quote that I love. He says, you join here to not to be cool, but to make others cool. And, and I, I really love the quotes. I, it totally resonates with me because what we are really here to do is to have this platform enabling other companies to deliver on their mission and that purpose. So whether you use our Azure platform, I'm not gonna go into details, Azure platform or our collaboration platform to 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 uh, run your energy company or to convert into a, the most sustainable company in your field, or then that's what the job we are doing. Now that change is completely what we also do in the Sweden office, right? Because before we were mainly selling and then making sure it worked. Now we are mm-hmm. actually very much uh, to be able to deliver on that. We've, it's very much about being able to partner with your customers and your partners 
to understand what are the challenges, what do they need to do, and then help them, not just choose the platforms, but then actually getting to, to real usage of them. Otherwise, it doesn't help us. So, so today we're very focused, for example, if we if we if we introduce teams to a customer, we're very focused on helping that customer getting usage out of teams because only then do we know that they can actually transform and become productive and then we help them to do the cool job that they are doing so a lot of our work our largest organization today is our customer success unit it was an organization that didn't exist a few years ago so their job is really to work with the customers uh, to actually help do the, all the great work they're doing. Um, so we do work, of course, very closely to customers. We help customers envision what they need to do with their digital journey. We put competences in place to help them do that. We run probably Sweden's largest partner network um, because that's how we do things. We don't we don't have an army of people doing implementation themselves. We work with customers ranging from the Atea and Tieto of this world to Capgemini, Accenture, but also to specific cloud partners. And we run uh, increasingly focused on, on the startup community. So that's, that's if I try to embellish what we do. And then of course, a big part of my fun job is, of course, also to work with our own internal uh, internal transformation because everything we can enable our customers to do can only be enabled if we transform, if we develop our culture, if we develop our skill sets, if we continuously learn what we need to learn. So that's a that's a part of my exciting position. Seems very really exciting. And I'll again go back to what you were saying about 2014 when this mindset, mindset or culture or the customer focus shift happened like it sounds very mm -hmm. simple making uh, others cool but <laughs> must have been a huge time because microsoft is not as uh, it's a huge company how yes. do you <laughs> kind of make this change from kind of a mindset of licenses to cloud to customer mm -hmm. and platforms mm -hmm. as you were talking mm -hmm. about were there initial challenges were the challenges also yes. in, yeah <laughs> Every, I think there were probably, I was not here in 2014, but I think there was challenges everywhere because it has to be. Your question is absolutely maybe the most important question when you try to do these things. And and uh, Microsoft, I don't know how many people were at the Microsoft at the time, but we are now about 160, 170,000. So you're talking about driving change across a massive, massive organization. Wow. And um, so, and I think it's, I think it's, it starts with, I, I think again, Satya Nadella, by the way, he has, uh, he has a um, he has has a book about his reflections on how to do this, which is called mm -hmm. Hit Refresh. I can very mm -hmm. warmly recommend it. I read it before I went into this process of 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 uh, engaging with Microsoft. But he started off with something very unusual, I think. And he's for being a Fortune 500 leader. He started off saying, "I need." When he came on board, he said, "Many very often when CEOs come on board, they look at the cost structure, they look at the organizational structure, mm. they, you know, change people and all of that." But he said, "We need to, we need to do soul searching. Okay. We need to find wow. out who we are going to be. So if if this is our mission uh, to make others look cool, to empower everybody in on the planet to do more." Um, who do we need to be? What's the culture we need to do? So he brought his leadership team together and they then defined what are the important things in our culture to be able to deliver on that. So, and I'll give you a few of them that I think are really relevant for startups and for anybody actually. And one is that they defined, we need to develop a growth mindset because the mm -hmm. difference mm -hmm. between a fixed mindset and a growth mindset is just so tremendous. A fixed mindset is somebody where you have all the answers, you're quick to answer, and you just go ahead and do things. A growth mindset, which of course, I, I would think most startups actually do build, but I think it's important not to lose it. It's a mindset where you continuously ask questions, you you continuously learn. The, the, the questions are more important than the answers. And this is uh, really a defining moment for somebody who came from a software license where, of course, the answers probably were much more important, right? Because it's a different mm -hmm. type of business. Then if you want to really do that, if you want to create that, you need to become customer obsessed. So now you come to one of my points in the beginning. <laughs> yes, and and yes. probably probably in prior life, Microsoft was not seen as customer obsessed. Mm -hmm. And today we are really driven by, we have to walk in our customers' shoes. We have to understand our customers and we have to turn our business models to really be 
relevant to our customers and hitting that for our customers. So customer obsession became an important thing. And the next thing was to say, if we're going to be a true growth mindset company and we want to be customer obsessed and we want to really bring out the best, there is no way we have to have a culture which is diverse and inclusive. We're not going, we, and, and this is a big thing in tech companies. We, we have not always been so good at that in the tech industry. Mm -hmm. And in Sweden, we're sometimes too stuck on gender and it's, and, and actually in some other countries too, but it's not just about gender. It's the wider real diversity with backgrounds, with industries, diversity of thought. And as I've learned along the way, then in, having an inclusive culture becomes maybe one of the most important thing to succeed with. Because if you have an inclusive culture, then people want to be part of your company. They yeah. want to come in there. They feel natural. They feel like they can bring the best to work. They feel like they can raise any questions. So you mm -hmm. will get the best into your company. So the inclusion became a really important part. And so as they lay this foundation to come back to your question, then of course it was about starting to act like that. You need to act like that from the top. So his leaders yeah. had to act like that, but you also had to then roll it out across the organization. So then a lot of the work, of course, moved also out to the countries. So then we need to work with, we work with our values, we work on inclusion, we do a ton of work on diversity inclusion, for example, we, we set our agenda. So we have customers in the building, we have customer, we've changed our whole office. So the majority of our space is actually for customers or partners and not for ourselves. So then you need to, I think this is maybe the most important thing. A culture never ever changes because of a PowerPoint. It changes because you have people, human beings, who fill that, who fill that vision with actions and doings every single day. And that's how you, in reality, change culture, according to me at least. So, <laughs> and that's what we work with, I would say. Brilliant. Again, so much power pack information in those three, four. I'll just try to summarize for our uh, community. I think you uh, touched on a very inter interesting subject of soul searching when we are uh, talking to entrepreneurs. And I think that's something very crucial for entrepreneurs as well, that when you are creating a venture, can you see yourself in it? Can mm. you see yourself being almost same or connected at the soul of the problem itself because then that will reflect in your pitch if it's a readout pitch it would never convince anybody to no. invest in you no. so first thing second point that that was equally important was you talked about growth mindset and i think that's where at times in technology companies what happens even when you're creating tech startups you find fi uh, you kind of get in touch uh, fall in love with your technology itself mm -hmm. and kind of and then technology then creates a kind of a box around you because mm. you need to be looking outside in for, for the technology to actually become growth focused. So I think growth yes. and technology grow hand in hand. Otherwise, technology has a tendency of going into an efficiency curve. So for it to grow, really, that growth mindset is there. I think then you talked about the values, uh, propagation, creation together, inclusion. I think that's the soft point of creating company. Mm. So brilliant talk so far. So <laughs> I don't know where to. Thank you. Good summary. <laughs> <laughs> but if, if you touched upon the startup side, let's let's talk yes. a little bit about startups and how Microsoft is working with startups so that mm -hmm. it could be so our community can also see what is it that they can get from Microsoft or the Microsoft enables for the startup side. Yeah, absolutely. So I think the. Uh, I think also uh, to all of you who are working, I know it's tough to be a startup and entrepreneur life is, uh, it's, it's glorified at times, but it's mostly really, really hard work. So, uh, so thank you for, for doing all that work, all of you who are on, online right now. And, I, and, and just to put some context to it, uh, and, and for some of you who have lived in Sweden your whole life, and some of you are new to Sweden maybe, and, and when I grew up, we didn't have startups basically. Um, it didn't really exist to be honest. <laughs> We had we had we were so fortunate in Sweden because we had these gigantic companies. We had Ericsson and ABB and Atlas Copco and Volvo and all of them. But but the startup community did not really exist. And and it's such a it's an amazing thing the impact the startup community has had on all of Sweden and not just I mean Stockholm is maybe obvious but it, but it, all of Sweden uh, and and this is seriously uh, taking the whole uh, the whole country forward. The fact that 
this has become such a vibrant uh, part of, of creating society. And if I then take this into to the Microsoft, so firstly, I talked about, I think, which is really, really key, I think, for all of you, because you, you may be doing so many different things. But Microsoft is a partner driven. One of the things that we took with us from, from the past is that we were always doing business through a partner ecosystem. And uh, we have more than 3,000 partners in Sweden alone. So we are we are really a vibrant partner ecosystem. And actually, we're more and more seeing the, um, the, the crossover between startups and ISVs and partners, uh, which is really fascinating. So there are many, many different conversations to be had here. But, but we have, uh, I would say, increasingly Microsoft as a total has increasingly focused on on startups and and that's to us really exciting especially being uh, in Sweden and startup community being so um, so uh, vibrant for example so one of the things um, a couple of things I want to mention one is that we do have a startup program which is actually a global program which we we also have we have a a person who is a lead for that in Sweden. So by joining the Microsoft Starter Program, you get support in terms of, I think the typical ones, uh, you get support in terms of credits, uh, et cetera, with be using our platforms, can get mentors, you can get support with your business, you can get into our ecosystem, which I, I really think is a, a really important point that we will keep talking actually much, much more about. Uh, we have, um, we, we're so excited about introducing uh, in March last year at Epicenter what we call Microsoft Reactor. Mm -hmm. uh, now, unfortunately, it ended up in the middle of COVID-19, but I hope we're soon going to be back into physical meetings. But Reactor is something that Microsoft is only doing in 10, I think it's 10 or 12 different cities across the world, where we actually have a physical space where we go in and uh, and work with developers. So we actually have a ton of learnings and courses and development. And especially if you are thinking of going into Azure or you know want to deepen your skills and meet like-minded people as well. So so rem check out Microsoft Reactor and and we are actually at the at the epicenter. Um, so that's something I, I really want to um, uh, to highlight. And and then I um, I think there's a, a few other angles. One is being um we find we find that many of the startups actually have a really good isv uh isv business or angle and what we have which is becoming more and more and i really for those of you that this is relevant you should really look at this but we have um if you become if you go in on the azure platform we have a marketplace so you can actually if you're an, uh, an isv you can actually if you get certified then on Azure and on our marketplace, you can actually be sold in any country after that because it's a worldwide marketplace. And we see some smaller companies that are having really big impact and who get a really quick ramp through this because once you're in there, our ecosystem is is thriving in UK or Middle East or, or anywhere. So it's and especially some of the impact startups, I would say, in healthcare and 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 green tech and all of these areas so that's a really interesting one and we have some news as well i think uh that is i don't think it's really out yet but i think it is coming out uh any day actually but we are uh we are launching a special focus because we clearly also see the inequality in in funding so there is a special focus going out on on female founders uh, so the news will be out I think beginning of of next week of actually uh, time to rise time to rise I believe it's called it's so it's so new for me as well but I believe it's called time to rise and um, it's a collaboration with SAB we work labs invest.com and I think circular partners uh, to actually uh, to improve the low percentage of capital going to women, uh, to women in Sweden, it's only one percent of the capital going to to uh, startups with with uh, women uh, women um, 
uh, women founders, which is for a country like Sweden, it's almost embarrassing to be honest. So we're also putting investments and and time uh, behind that. So we are, um, yeah, really eager for anybody here with also with with um, uh, female founders or partners in in the company. Check this out. Uh, and I think Rebecca placed it in the in the chat actually the link. Yeah, so. I see that. I see that. Rebecca, thank you so much for sharing it. Uh, so the startup community over here can check this link. We'll post it out with our follow-up email as well. Great. The community. Uh, and we should push out the startup link as well, actually. We'll send you the link to the startup as well, because that's a good one to go and check. Yeah, th that'll also be good. So uh, the other thing that you were talking about. So so brilliant. I think a lot of so, so moving from a, in a single lifetime, uh, I can relate to that as well, because I was in a similar situation that we had a discussion on small businesses when I was young. And then suddenly came the startup mm, uh, yes. fever, and now it's so pervasive. I think the next the next world is being created by entrepreneurs. So it's, I think that's where yeah. the entire thing impact and all. And mm. it's very important that initiatives like uh, these are created, which can diffuse or take away the imbalance uh, that we have in the market when mm. we talk about some finder, founders getting funding while others cannot get so i think it's yeah. a great initiative to uh, to have but uh, helene if we if i were to uh, ask you you have worked so much in the technology space and you've worked close with businesses which are customer focused your own passion is about customer focus uh, and all Seeing the world today at a, at a very big level, what do you think are two or three main challenges that we need to crack together? Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, yeah. We, have in, we have enough big challenges right now, right? <laughs> yeah, no, I think it's, uh, it's uh, absolutely, no. And I think it's, uh, I think what gives me hope is exactly these conversations. But I think the, the, it's clear to me, I mean, for me, uh, the, the challenge of, of environment, climate, uh, mm -hmm. in a wider perspective, uh, we we have to we have to solve for that uh mm -hmm. and there is we're already behind our schedule and and we are clearly not going to solve it through policy making only mm -hmm. right uh i think if yeah. if if policy making and regulatory uh initiatives have solved it they would already have been solved it's not going to be solved uh, by looking at somebody else to do it. So I think to mm. me, that's, uh, that's, that's a absolutely top of mind. And I think looking at uh, both the country I'm living in now, but also countries I've lived in, in before, I think the uh, societal inclusion is such a big topic. And uh, I think we, the lack of that um, shows up in so many, uh, uh, so many, um, uh, if you look at the media news in Sweden right now, which is mm -hmm. a lot about the uh, uh, the um, uh, gang criminals, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and 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 all of that, I think it's um, it, there are a lot of reasons, and I don't want to become political, but I, mm -hmm. I think you mm -hmm. will see many effects of not creating an inclusive society, okay. negative effects, but also a lack of the po positive effects. So we know, for example, that we're going to be missing seventy. 70,000, at least 70,000 IT professionals in Sweden in, in a year and a half, at least 70,000. Now, how many people do we yeah. have who are lacking, who are lacking access to good tech education in schools? Because mm -hmm. we don't have, mm -hmm. we don't have an inclusive education system. So we don't get, give the opportunity for all in the same way. Sweden has a, a large uh, community who were born outside of Sweden. I think we had 20% of the population or something uh, born outside yeah. of Sweden. The opportunity to to make sure we become inclusive and make education mm -hmm. is enormous. And then we also actually get diversity of thought and we will create even better startups and we will solve for more problems, etc. So I think inclusion, inclusive society, mm -hmm. and then the climate and environment are two of our absolutely, uh, if we can solve for those two, I think, um, and, and that connects to, that connects actually to, to, to what we call then the skilling. We, the skilling, I mean, continuous, continuous learning and continuous skilling, it's so high on our agenda. Um, I would say those are, if I do three, those are my three. No, I think uh, very well put. I think because learning, it starts at very root. So if 
for example if the world is going towards tech it's going towards inclusion it's going towards solving climate thing now those thoughts are usually not in standard school curriculums if we take the global view maybe exactly. uh, the developed countries have those things coming in at certain stages but those things are not there in curriculum uh, so i think it's a lot to do how learning needs to change so that we at a very early stage can create a, how would you say a, create a generation that comes up with the solutions while they, yes. as they meet the workforce so i think that's a huge shift that yeah. needs to be there and then you have talked about let's take let's do a little bit of brainstorming here i think that will be very interesting I'll, i am loving this conversation so far <laughs> so if there is so inclusion is a challenge and in inclusion you said that uh, microsoft for example is launching this huge initiative with some of your partners when you're saying that the vc space or the funding mm. space is broken mm. what what can we do because the gap is too large because yeah. one initiative great what else needs to do needs to be done at a system level because this is a system yeah. level yes it is imbalance yeah. that we see yes. and we have been talking about it if we see media in the last 5 years mm. in the 5 years i've been active in sweden that sector a lot there's a lot of talk how do we make a system level change to let's say 2 years down the road if we are talking about a society which is now there are 20% 20% funding is going to women what achieve that yeah uh, this is you, you know you're absolutely right and and it's so sometimes you get discouraged when you see media in in Sweden 2021 and we're still talking about that uh, that one percent so yeah what does it take to get the the system change but I'm thinking when you say that and all your activities but there are some organizations that are just standing out to me yours is one of them but if you look and if you add to that organizations like changes hub which i think is an mm. amazing organization uh global village which is ahmed's um uh, yeah. or the yarba vekan and and you yeah. have founding families behind that uh like axel jonsson etc albright uh, albright foundation who are doing so much of the uh, uh, actual uh, they're bringing out the statistics to make sure that we don't drop our eyes from this important ball right mm. and i'm wondering when you're saying this because clearly we're not making the system change through politicians and i wish they would have done the system change right but we are not making the system change and maybe maybe what we need to do uh, and I'm, there are probably more uh, organizations coming up in the chat which i would love because we all always interested to understand more of the organizations doing impact on this but maybe what it's maybe what needs happen is that we we find a way to bring these organizations together so you get the the bigger powers uh behind it maybe we can use some but i saw that eric has been here uh from nochen and i'm a big fan of what nochen is doing but maybe we need to find a way to bring and with some of us larger companies who can also scale but maybe we need to bring try to bring this together so so yeah. so the joint forces actually forces a system change because right now you're absolutely right I, and I, I think we all have a responsibility to use I talked about this in a, in a company meeting this morning actually but we all have a responsibility to use our platforms and our positions to positively impact these really important areas so we need to do that and I think many are doing that in Sweden but it doesn't become a system change and you're absolutely right that's what we need and maybe we need to find a way to to bring all these amazing initiatives and and i think passionistas that we have yeah, have yeah. around us so it forces a system change so it actually can take it to to policy makers um and say you cannot you cannot not mm, take mm. this to the next level now because the movement is so we need maybe we need that movement i think that's so well put and i you were talking a little while ago that you have a huge more thousands of partner network and it's so good to see an initiative taking shape that you uh, uh, just mentioned so i think organizations like yours can really drive these change because you have the resources you can get collaborations around and it's so good to see this initiative taking shape and all power to you to build even more initiatives on that side um, i would also bring back because you were saying you put learning at the last point and then you had climate and inclusion i think that's a huge uh, how would you say they are connected in so many different ways yeah. for example when i'm coaching entrepreneurs one of the learning i personally feel comes out when i'm coaching female founders they are not just pushing their idea hard enough at 
at homes at societies at school mm. level we are not giving enough confidence out yeah. for them to speak out their mind with their idea and when you don't speak out your mind with your idea you don't win a pitch because pitching is yes. about saying yeah. yes you are you are pitching at this level you cannot pitch a startup at this yeah. level the investor would not get convinced so i think that's a that's not culture that's how traditional education schooling exactly. and homes are working how do we enable that change and that probably is a big reason why it's going to that 1% versus 99% yeah. because we are not powering up the engine at the very base no no, no. i think that's completely right and, and we tend to see that you see that in in things like um salary compensation differences as well right i exactly. mean men tend to have a higher education because they, i think they ask for more <laughs> not necessarily that they're doing a better job so i think it's it's an education thing um, but I also think uh, to that point, and I think all of us need to try to influence the the, the VC uh, VC teams. There are not enough women on the VC teams either. It tends to be a, a lot of men on the VC side. Yes. So I think that makes that gap wider to what you just said to the one pitching who may mm -hmm. come in as as a a, a more you know not not overselling and then the person who expecting to be oversold or something <laughs> uh exactly. be, so so the gap is too wide between that i think so, so yeah you have to make a much higher jump as a woman to just come to the same yeah. level of jump too. Yeah. so i think it's it's yeah. huge difference yeah um coming to um how would you say we talked a little bit on climate as well what do you think can be done on the climate side because you mentioned a little bit earlier the climate is also stuck in a policy framework and here we had mm. somebody uh, very young from sweden uh, as a girl who came up and started talking about climate and then everybody joined uh, is policy the way to make because climate is not a forever thing that we can change it's a very short leash of time that we have to make that change Hmm. how can we enable that how can we enable entrepreneurs there like i don't know yeah it's absolutely and i think the it's it's a bit sad and i know this is recorded so it may be controversial but i i i think the ones taking the lead right now is more actually uh the industry entrepreneurs because if you look at for example if you look at north vault if you look at hybrid uh if you like it's actually been they were a startup just a couple of years ago yeah. <laughs> now of course the founder had uh, had had investments to put in himself and all of it but it's actually starting something brand new which is probably going to have a bigger impact on our on our climate and and footprint than any regulation that was put into place the last two years so i almost feel like it's it's the uh, if you take the whole ecosystem of companies and company commitments and uh startups and the ecosystems that are being built out in green tech climate tech and all of it are i think i'm putting more hope into that currently than i'm doing to the political agenda if you if you and i'm I think this is again, I think we have such a responsibility, all of us who can make a difference. Mm. So Microsoft is already uh, uh, climate neutral, which many, right. many companies are not. But, and clearly that's not enough. So we have an agenda that by 2030, we will need to be positive. And by 2040, okay. we have actually made a commitment that we are going to be able to have taken back everything that we have actually om omitted in the world, omitted in the world since the company was founded. And I actually think large companies need to make these BHAGs, the big, hairy, audacious yeah. goals for themselves. Because if you have also, if you have made this much money and you've used up the world's resources uh, and you do have on top of it, the opportunity to develop technology to actually do something about it, I think that's the responsibility. And then I think the, the ecosystems with other companies like we have teamed up with Vattenfall for example in uh -huh, Sweden uh -huh. to create the world's uh, most uh, most environmental friendly data center because data centers are a big issue from a environment perspective uh, then we have a responsibility to team up with both established companies and 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 startups to solve for bigger issues and I, I this is what gives me hope to be honest that this is how because and at the end of it I think there's a customer and a consumer power. At the end of it, I think, um, at the end of it, I think, I don't know if Eric was here, after Eric from from uh, from Nochen was here after they released their, they just released um, 
oh, impact what is it called? Impact, impact report, yes. exactly, that they're working with Harvard on. And I love that initiative. Uh, it, once it becomes comparable, Mm. If you can look at if you can look at Microsoft, and if you want to compare Microsoft with GCP, AWS, uh, Oracle, IBM, whoever you want to compare us with, and you can look at exactly the compares, comparable numbers and say mm. that my impact at the bottom line after I've used all the word resources is X percent better or worse than somebody else, it will guide our decisions. So I think that's okay. very powerful from an investor perspective, but also who, yeah. where we put our own money actually as consumers and customers. Okay, okay. <laughs> we, we, we have questions coming up. We'll move to them we know in a little while. Please collect them. I have a couple of last points which I just want to quickly run over. Uh, again, Helene, thank you so much for compressing the entire big issue into a set of solutions. So that came out in the last two, three minutes. I'll just repeat it for our audience. Number one, the change that we need on the climate side. First thing we talked about was enabling startups who are going into, uh, like you <laughs> talked about not fold, but there is so much new startup creation. So enabling yes. startup is one big initiative. Then you talked about that organizations which have been around for 10s, 20s, 50s, or hundreds of years, they need to set BHAGs. Mm -hmm. Now BHAGs, as you were saying, big, hairy, audacious goals. So that's the second level thing. I love it. I like putting a strong commitment there and then following up, it up on that. You talked about ecosystems and I think that's where Microsoft is very powerful. You have a strong ecosystem. You talked about Microsoft's own goals over there. So I think ecosystem enablement meant if this can happen from organizations like yours. And then you talked about a very important thing, which was consumer power. Uh, mm. And we talked about the impact list. That's where I want to bring a little bit about Amanda, which is part of the Startup Giant Stockholm team. She's building a startup to build, to take the brand's advertising spend into impact space. So it's a mm. great idea, Amanda. It connects with Helene's yeah. point here. I can feel it. So <laughs> great work for here. Helene, if we move forward from here, um, let's see. We know, do we have some? Specific questions, let's dive into them and maybe we can take one or two more general questions again if we have time left at the end. So I'm bringing you in, Vinod, if you want to talk in or should I take up the questions? Just let me know. Hold on. Uh, so, Vinod, your presenter mode is going on. I hope it works. Let's Looks see. like it's coming on. Yeah. Hi, Vinod. Thank you so much for joining in. Uh, you need I... to unmute. Your voice is not coming in. Can you check? Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Great. Thank you, Naimul. Thank you for a very inspiring session, Helene. Um, Thank you. We have we have audience, so I'll take them from the top. Uh, first question from Silvio. Um, you talked about the role of culture for companies. What do you think about MNAs, which is mergers and acquisitions, which fail very often because mm. of the interplays in the in the subsequent mm. you know culture mergers that happen? Mm. It's a very good uh, question. I think uh, I think there's statistics on this that the MNAs that f fail are usually about culture, and we spend most of our time doing product fits when we do MNAs and looking at the balance sheet, etc. But it really is about culture. So, so I think this is um, I I think you and this comes also back to actually when we talk about the kind of people we have <laughs> on board of these types of companies i think you need to as a leader you need to um if i were to do an m a today i would have firstly a special focus on culture what i did the dd but then i would have a team actually focus on how you how do you build the culture together what's the culture you want to achieve with this how do you build that together and how do you do that how do you show up as a leader in that new culture to display that this is what you mean for real and uh, it is such an important point. And uh, when you grow as startups, if you buy companies, but also I think in in high growth, in hyper growth uh, companies that you may sometimes come into and you go into new markets and all of it, never, never let go of culture, always overspend time on culture. And I, I sometimes say when I, I speak to our customers that I think we live, it's never been, it's always been important. It's more important than ever. Because actually we're looking, we're living in a paradigm when everything 
that can will be digitalized, no matter what company you buy or whatever, everything that is digitalized can be copied. Now, what remains as your competitive advantage is actually your culture. So I would, I would, especially in an M&A situation, I would really put somebody in charge, double down on it, have it on my agenda, have it on the board agenda, not just the product fit, the synergies, <laughs> and the typical things that you do in an M&A. Yeah, well said. Uh, you know, there's a saying I love that uh, bad culture eats good strategy. Totally. Very, very Absolutely. true. Absolutely. Great. So the next question comes from Michael Blair. There's, in fact, two questions there. One, is there a music innovation and coordination office here in Sweden? And education used in the health and well-being sector. Mm, oh, really good question. We don't have a special music innovation uh, office here. Um, we, I think the education sector will um, evolve tremendously in, uh, in taking these things in. We have an education lead in Sweden, uh, which is definitely somebody we can tap into uh, with companies here. I would also say that we have um, Mo Young is one of um, Microsoft's, speaking about m &As, one of Microsoft's, uh, I think, larger acquisitions, actually, uh, with Minecraft. And Minecraft is a really big part of the education, uh, education play in many, many countries. So there's something here we can discuss around, but we don't have a specific music uh, studio here. Okay. Um, there's a question from Struan back to the point about speaking out. So does the Swedish consensus culture and not rocking the boat, doesn't mm -hmm. this have an impact on, you know, the cultures of those who attempt to speak out? Mm. Is there a cultural challenge? <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a really good one. I think, you know, I, I, came to, I came to Stockholm seven years ago and I moved here from Boston and I had moved from Boston to Boston from London. So I, I lived in different cultures. And I think this is a very good question. And every time you work on this, you need to keep asking yourself this question. In one way, it can. On the other hand, it's, Swedish culture can be a much better culture to speak out in because you don't have the hierarchical you don't worry about the boss things about you. You don't worry if somebody's in the meeting who is a VP. Whereas I've worked in more, much more uh, hierarchical systems where you're really concerned if the boss is in the in the room, for example, and you don't want to speak out. So it can work for and against you. I think what you what you need to you need to understand the culture you're going into, and then you have to build inclusion from there. So I think you need to also as a leader. I think you need to encourage. Uh, you need to really encourage that and, and realize when somebody's, you know, try to be there when you feel like, oh, Naimula, it feels like you're thinking of something. What's on your mind? I really want to hear that. I think that's one. But the second point is where we had one of the conversations. I think you have to be so focused on bringing in diversity. If you bring in, if you bring in other way of thinking about things and asking questions, and then you show up as a really inclusive leader, then you, you, you will create a new culture, uh, irrespective of that. So I think, but I think diversity in Sweden is really important because we are quite a small country. If you are from, if you were born in the 60s or 70s, or maybe even in the beginning of the 80s, the, the school system was extremely homogeneous, which means that we have created kind of the same product of all of us. <laughs> so unless you have lived in other countries or been exposed to it, and now I think the younger age groups is a bit more diverse in, in there, but it's so important not to stay in that homogeneous consensus thinking. And, and just maybe to add one last thing, and I say this when I speak to, to people who work on boards, I am so much more worried about the questions that are not asked in the boardroom than the questions that are asked in the boardroom. Uh, because if you don't get them asked, you can be pretty sure that they are being floating somewhere around it and you're missing something important. But the ones that are asked, you can internalize and you can, you know, oh, shoot, we didn't think about this. Michael, can you go and have a look at this, for example? But the biggest concern for anybody should be the questions that are not being asked. I'd like to add half a minute here, because uh, I think I can share some personal experience. Like six years ago when I came to Sweden, it was a very different culture for me. But what I've found is that Sweden, we, we talk about the consensus culture on one side, but, but, but we should not forget that Sweden is hugely innovative as well. So there mm -hmm. are two, two forces at play here. 
So yeah. I've always found it very easy to share new ideas in a group. And then for new ideas, it's very important that some sort of consensus is built. Otherwise, innovation cannot fly if everybody hmm. is not on the same, uh, how would you say, vision. So I think I found it to be a very good quality of the Swedish system that you have a consensus or we have a consensus side, but we also have a new idea side. They well work very well for scaling up, I think. Mm. So my experience has been very different. So I, I found it an advantage in uh, many meetings or whatever work situation. Great to hear your perspective on that. That's really good to hear. Absolutely. We have a question from Cassandra. And this is about uh, you know the role of AI in healthcare. Mm. There is always the concern about you know can can the bias in technology do damage. Mm. So what are your thoughts mm. on that? Yeah, no, this is a, such an important question, and we cannot. It's not one that the industry can gloss over easily. Uh, I think uh, we're all excited by AI because on the positive side, it can save lives. Again, it can help for an inclusive education, and it can do so many things for us. Save the climate. It can do so many things. Uh, but I think the uh, we talk about in a in a loose way, maybe responsible AI. This is really important, and I think. It's both how the companies, how we as companies act, but I actually think we need to have, and this is difficult, I know, but I actually think we need to have regulations around AI in a whole new way. Uh, it's not an it's not an easy topic at all because on one in one hand you know we're doing pox with uh, university hospitals around the world on how AI can help us detect cancer much earlier than anything else. It will save hundreds of thousands of lives when this has been figured out. Uh, but you cannot just let this free because absolutely uh, biases and 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 privacy issues and and just to connecting it back ai to me has made i've worked with diversity and inclusion in this industry now for 25 years but as i started to understand the power of ai i became acutely aware of how important diversity and inclusion becomes because if the ones behind ai are all and excuse me for all uh, for all Western men, but if all it's all white men fifty years old, that's how AI will be programmed. We will never change what we just talked about that we need to change. So, so, so getting the diversity behind um, behind uh, behind AI, it's 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 absolutely vital. But it's not enough. I, we need to think responsible AI. We need to be able to actually report as AI companies, I think we need to report, how do we do that? How do we actually create that? And I also think there needs to be regulation as this becomes so pervasive in life, I think. Brilliant. We okay. have yeah, overrun we the have meeting the time questions. by, yeah, perfect. Um, Helene, um, so on AI, I think you touched on a very important point and we had a similar thing on climate side because policy is too slow to catch up with the climate mm. crisis. And I think with AI, we are saying that regulation is too slow for the speed of AI. So I think we have a similar challenge yes. in a different domain, so I think which needs to be bridged. Uh, but I'd like to thank you uh, so much, Helene, for being here, for Microsoft, for being here, for uh, talking through these issues, sharing your uh, insights with the entrepreneurship community here and later on with the uh, when the talk is spread on our global network. A big thank you to you, a big thank you to the Startup Grind Stockholm team and the community here that joined in. Uh, we'll be sharing links. Uh, Helene, somebody is asking if there is one thing uh, we can take. What was the name of the book that you mentioned by Microsoft CEO? It's Hit to Refresh. Hit to Refresh Hit by refresh. Satya Nadella. Now I can really recommend it. It's a, it's a very good inside book. Brilliant. Have a lovely uh, afternoon, everyone, and thank you all for being here. Thanks so Take much, care. and thank you for having yeah. me. Thank you. Bye-bye.